Hey everybody, Mike here. Uh, this is the makeup lecture for the uh, week that uh, we were out. And as I explained in class, this is a, a, a relatively brief lecture about the topic of freelancing. And this applies to both our public relations work and our business writing work. Now, uh, the reason this is a valuable topic, although it is certainly off the beaten path uh, from, from what we uh, usually cover, is that whether you write or edit or have any contact, or even if you just have some contact with the writing process, it's rare that all the writing goes on in-house. Uh, that means that you'd be wise to understand what's going on in that relationship between, uh, between uh, an enterprise and their freelance writing team or any particular freelance uh, writer. Uh, and uh, the benefit, the bonus here for some of you is that I know you, you aspire to do some independent work as consultants or as writers. And so this, uh, this uh, will give you a little bit more uh, candid insight on the problems uh, and benefits of that than you might get simply from asking someone at a party how this flows uh, out. I've been doing this kind of work uh, in some freelance capacity uh, for for. Uh, gosh, nearly two decades uh, off and on. Um, and so uh, I've seen some things that, that may help you. So uh, without the usual slides, because this is a list of things, we'll, we'll proceed this way. And I've got a, a, a notebook here, so if I need to draw a picture, I'll, I'll hold it up. And my, my glasses are reflecting terribly here, aren't they? Well, maybe we'll do it that way. I don't know. It's just the, the audio is the important thing. We'll do that. Okay, uh, this is a, a lecture I, I give, and the title is uh, Unglamorous, and sometimes it's called Unfabulous, uh, What Freelancers Wish They Knew. And whether you were working with them or you are one, this is what you want to know. I want to talk about 11 rules for freelance uh, writing enterprises and general consulting uh, in three different parts. Part one is about the foundation of the work. Part two is about the money side of the work, and part three is my idea of graphics, is holding my fingers like this. And part three is uh, about uh, finding work, keeping that stream coming in. So let's begin. Part one, the foundation. Figure out if you are ready to do this. Now there are specific questions you need to be able to answer uh, to know whether or not you are really ready to do this. And you need to know whether or not, or you need to to know whether or not you are. Um, um, interested and capable of this kind of lifestyle, uh, you will not be getting a regular monthly check of the same amount every month unless you set yourself up that way and have plenty of work to back it up. That's not going to be the case for a long, long time in, uh, in most of this work. Uh, are you ready to deal with the, uh, the insecurity of that? Uh, have you ever worked at a situation where uh, you did not know if you were going to have uh, the same check next week? Are you good at living with uncertainty? Uh, are you capable of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of continuing to be encouraged in your efforts even when there is not a great deal of external support available? Um, you're the one who has to get up in the morning and tell yourself to work. You're the one who has to get up and find the next job. There is not a boss that stands over you or checks in on you every few hours or every few days to make sure you're doing it. Uh, if you've got to have that kind of support, and there's nothing wrong with needing that kind of support, but if you're that kind of person, you're probably not ready to do this. Uh, another consideration about whether or not you're ready is if you have the experience and skills to do so. And experience is really just a proxy for skills, uh, although it does have its own purposes. If you don't have uh, some credentials, if you don't have some clients that have uh, 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 spoken highly of you in the past and that you can offer as examples of people ready to put their faith in you or have had put their faith in you, then you, you probably won't be able to get work in the first place. As for the skills, you're always going to get better. So, so uh, uh, it's pretty hard to come to a point where you go, well, I'm just, I'm just uh, not quite there yet. You're probably going to always look back at your you're, you're probably going to look back at your stuff in, in the future and say, well, I, I wish that in the past I'd been more prepared, but you're never going to be perfectly prepared. So if you've got the spirit for this, if you've got the attitude for this, you realize that it's not going to be uh, anything like uh, a, a, a typical job with an employer, then yeah, you, you may be ready for this. But ask yourself these questions as candidly as you can. Uh, the second 
of the 11 here under foundation total uh, 11 is think about the practicalities. That means you're going to need a space in which to work. A dedicated space. You can't say I'm going to do this on the kitchen table and expect to have work actually flow from that spot. I know people who say, well, I work from the kitchen table or I work from the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, well, let's keep it at that, or I work at the couch or whatever, or I do the work in bed. Well, that's, that's fine to fill in, but it turns out that for most folks, you have to have a committed physical space in order to get you in the, uh, in the mindset to do this on a daily basis. Uh, on a more practical note, since we're talking about number two, practicalities, uh, you don't want to have to pull up your stuff, gather up your stuff at six o'clock at night because it's time for dinner. Uh, you want to have a workspace where you can uh, spread your stuff out. I, I don't think I can turn this screen too much. Well, I'll turn it a little bit. What the heck? We'll see if we knock off the desk. You can see that I work from a, a dedicated workspace. There's an old computer there in the corner. Uh, I can't really turn this down much. You can see the floor, but there's a there's a, a printer there. There's uh, the uh, technical equipment there, computer equipment there, and on the desk, which you can't see over here to my right is my phone and pens and another monitor over here to the left is a stack of papers and uh, back here on the floor is stuff from school I have file cabinets behind this screen this is a place where work gets done if you don't have a place where you can set things and leave them then you you need to think again about how to set that up uh Let's see, we'll talk about practicalities as we go. A uh, th uh, third uh, issue on foundation is another practicality, and that has to do with, uh, with, with whether or not you can afford to do this. You don't want to extend yourself at the outset. You don't want to extend yourself ever as a, uh, as, as a freelancer. Now, uh, what I mean by extend yourself is put yourself in a place where you can't pay your bills and you can't or you can't fulfill the promises that you've made to clients. Uh, if uh, if you don't have some savings, you're you're probably uh, not uh, not ready for this, and we'll talk about the specifics of that savings in a bit. If you don't have um, some uh, some clients or at least one or two clients who who can make part of that monthly expense for you with their billing and that aren't ne uh, likely going away anytime soon. Uh, you're probably not ready. You have to have clients and time and savings. So don't put yourself in a position where if you if you jump into it and something goes wrong, you're you're totally screwed. Excuse me. Um, I remember uh, when I used to do stand up, um, uh, meeting Jeff Foxworthy, who you may have heard of. And he's uh, he was climbing up the comedy ladder at that point and just gotten a real taste of big success. And we were sitting in the green room one one night, a bunch of comics and. And Foxworthy said uh, um, when he got his first gig, he had done some open mic nights and done some comedy. And he, uh, he said, uh, I got my first week-long work as a comedian. I called the nightclub. They booked me for a week of opening, the lowest rank there is, of, of emceeing. And they were going to pay me whatever it was, 50 bucks a week or 50 bucks a show or whatever. And he said, so I immediately left quit my job, and started being a comedian. And at the end of the first week, that was all I had lined up. That was it. I had uh, the money in my pocket from the end of the week, and I had failed to book anything afterwards. So, so don't, uh, don't extend yourself at the outset, and don't expect to get lucky like Foxworthy did. It uh, worked out for him. Step number four in the foundation part of this, of our 11 points, step number four, know the nut. Know the nut. That's a term, the nut, is the minimum amount it takes to pay all the core, can't do without bills every month. Your rent or your mortgage, your electricity, your phone bill, your food, the gas for your car, any other commitment payments, house payment, car payment, or car payment, whatever you have, that's the nut. You can do without a meal out. You can do without... Uh, um, uh, the 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 uh, the movies you go to, or the rental, or the cable, or rental of the movies, or cables, or what have you, cable TV. But you can't do without those basic bills. Which, if you miss even one, you screw up your credit rating, uh, and and you put yourself at, at risk. So know what the nut is. Sit down with a piece of paper and write down from your checkbook or from your from your. Uh, from your uh, bank online, banking online, and write down line by line how much you spent. My rent is whatever, eighteen hundred dollars a month. Uh, my gas looks like the past few months I spent seventy five dollars on gas, and figure out if that's money, if that's gas from going back and forth to work, or that's just gas from living. 
Uh, my electricity is $60. My water is every six months, and that's $15 a month average uh, over that period of time. Uh, I spend uh, $400 a month on food. Uh, it costs me an average of $200 in random expenses a month for the kids. Well, pretty soon you're up to, what would that be here in North Virginia? Could be, you know, three grand or so. Can you guarantee three grand? If you don't think you can guarantee three grand, don't get into it. If you don't think in whatever your number is, your number may be much lower, of course. Uh, if you uh, if you can uh, get, okay, I can get 2000 but I have enough money in savings where for the next six months, I could make only 2000 a month and, and contribute 1000 a month out of savings, then that's okay to begin, too, if you can afford to take that kind of loss. And if you think in the next six months you'll be able to acquire enough new clients, enough new work, that you'll make it forward. It really is no magic here. It's nothing but writing down the numbers and figuring out if you can make the nut, the nut being the amount it takes to live and preserve your way of life. Now, if you want to pare that down and say, look, you know, I don't, I don't need to drive as much. I can cancel my cable. I can, uh, I can uh, cancel uh, this extra cell phone I have or what. I don't know I have an extra cell phone, but you know, you've got to uh, some some uh, feature on there you can cut out. Uh, I can cancel HBO, whatever it takes. If you want to work like this, you're going to have to sacrifice, especially at first. So know the nut, number four. So recap, number one, figure out if you're ready. Number two, think about the practicalities. Number three, do not extend yourself, especially at the beginning. Don't get past where you can do things. And number four, understand, write down the dollars and cents nut so you're always ready to, to, to know what the core is. What does it take to survive? All right, that's, uh, that's part one, the foundation. Part two is the money side of this, which we've sort of begun to, to, to get at here with the last one. Uh, let's see, that's, this is number five. Administrivia, as I call it, is a bigger deal than you think. Uh, there are expenses uh, of both uh, uh, cash and time that go into simply administering uh, your work as a freelancer. Uh, one part is, is prospecting, that is looking for work. Another part is keeping up with billing. I think you can see just the edge there of that black box on the wall next to my lovely Taylor uh, Concert Mini, uh, which I love, uh, guitar. Uh, right there is a, is a stack of four um, file bins and each one has something different in it. At the top up there, as you can see the edge of maybe, at the top is all the receipts that I, that I have from things that I've bought because a lot of those things are going to be uh, tax deductible at the end of the year. Keep in mind your taxes are about to go up if you, if you are a freelancer because right now your employer pays, quote unquote, half of your, uh, half of your Social Security. Now you're responsible for it. So that's roughly a 7% increase, 7% uh, additional to your taxes because now you have to pay that. So it's kind of a penalty for working for yourself. Uh, in the next box down there, I have a, a, a box just for contracts and agreements so I can pull them back up and see if we agreed to do it such and such. I don't have to dig into that very much, but you have to have that there. Uh, in the next one, I keep track of separate expenses from my work because your work isn't everything. Family is one thing, and then you might have other projects that you're doing. So I keep those expenses tracked there. And in the bottom, I keep outstanding invoices and uh, outstanding uh, 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 purchases. So I, I know how much money is coming in from various clients. Uh, I've got their invoice copies in that, uh, in that uh, folder or in that basket. And then I've also got, if I ordered something, you know, say from Amazon or something, I've got a receipt in there for that. So I know it's coming. I know to follow up if it doesn't arrive on time. And the same with checks. So there's a lot of administrivia. Uh, and that's that's a big chunk of it right there. It's just, just keeping track of it. That's going to take some of your time, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I spend a fair amount of time just keeping here my current to-do list, which evolved from these to-do lists, each of which contain various uh, matters that uh, have to be addressed down the road. So there's a whole lot of organizing what you're doing. It's not just, hey, I got an assignment. I'm going to go write uh, this memo for this guy, or I'm going to go write this white paper for this woman, and uh, and that's that's it. It's not like that at all. You have to be able to know where you stand in terms of the work as it progresses. Um, so administrivia is going to be a big part of your time. It's going to take 20 30% of your time, uh, and until you reach a point, 
where you can hire somebody to pick up some of this stuff for you to help you out, uh, you, you, you're going to have to account for that, which is why freelancers and independent people work a lot more hours than anybody else uh, anyway. Uh, number six in the part two here is set up your finances formally. Here's what I mean. Don't, don't uh, commingle your, your business funds with your, uh, with your family account. Uh, set up a separate checking account for business set up, or even just set up a separate savings account uh, for, for yourself, uh, for, for what you do in business. And then decide each month to pay yourself out of that. Say, I'm going to take out of there. It takes me, I would like to make $4,000 a month. Say that's what you, you're going to get. Well, set up an automatic billing out of your, out of your savings that writes you a check for $4,000 a month into deposits its into your savings. It's easy to do. It takes 25 seconds on, uh, where did I get 25? That's random. Uh, 25, 30 seconds to do on on online banking. When you get a check, you deposit it into your savings. You don't worry about, oh, I got a big check and go have dinner. No, no, no. That's not what you do. You start setting up this sort of pipeline of income so you can live a reasonable, predictable financial life. Now, uh, what you want to avoid doing is going into the bank with a big cigar and saying, I want to set up a whole banking system, a whole financial system. I'm not a financial planner, so I'm certainly not telling you uh, for, for, uh, for, for legal purposes how this works. I'm telling you in practice, you go in there and you know, a good bank's going to do you right, but at the same time, you don't want to go and set up a bunch of needless expenses uh, where these, these accounts cost a certain fee per month. Uh, all you need to do is be able to turn out the work, keep track of it, and write checks. If you can do that, you can, you can, you can keep track of your money. So Make sure that there's a formal record of what you do for yourself. Set up separate accounts if that helps, uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, and and never let this get out of hand. Now, probably the most important thing in the financial section, and it's saying a lot for me to say this is the most important. That glare is killing me. It's probably bothering you too. I'll be so glad when my glasses, my good glasses, come back from the glass hospital. I feel like I look like some sort of mutant ninja turtle. I don't know. This is crazy. I hate these. Uh, anyway, the thing that you want to know, key out of this, is you've got to set up one account for sure, and you call it taxes. Look at how much you paid last year in federal taxes, everything, not just income taxes, but Social Security and, and, and income taxes. Uh, set that. Figure out how much you paid last year, percentage of your income, and figure out how much you paid to your state income taxes. And that's going to be, let's say, it's going to come out to be after your typical deductions. The bottom line percentage, which is all we're interested in, is let's say it's going to be, I don't know, 18, 20 percent. Every time you get a check, take out 20 percent of it and drop it into that tax account. Because it turns out, and maybe you don't know this, those of us who work for ourselves have to pay our taxes not once a year, but four times a year to the federal government and to the state. And you've got to write a check and send it in at the end of each fiscal quarter, their fiscal quarter, not yours. And, and if you don't send that in, you are liable for uh, huge fines uh, for being in violation. So if you make a check for $4,000 for, a, for a, an operation, for a gig, and let's say you're setting apart, you're setting aside 20%, that's 800 bucks. You get a check for 4,000, Divide it 800 in tax, 3200 in your in your main account that you keep your income in. Uh, write it down on a piece of paper or in a spreadsheet. Four thousand dollars, 800 paid to taxes, net income 3200. And then find out from your from your you can find out it's like the 15th of uh, what is it April 15th and January 15th and August 15th I think. Uh, you you have to send in a check. Don't quote me on that, but you can look it up. Uh, send in a check uh, to the federal government and they'll give you a form to fill out and you just go to the IRS website and go to the state website. Send this stuff in or you're going to be in a world of hurt because you're going, man, I'm making a lot of money here as a freelancer, a lot more than I ever did. And then you get to the end of the year and you find out you owe 25-30% of your income in, in taxes and you're going, oh, boop, boop, ba -doo, uh, it's like you just lost on the prizes, right? Okay. So you want to be sure you're setting that aside. So set up your finances formally, pay attention to the uh, to the tax problem. Okay, 
Uh, number seven, this is also in the money thing, and this is kind of fun. Retainers are king. A lot of times you get gigs, and most of the time you get a gig, and they'll be uh, it'll be uh, either assigned to somebody or you'll you'll uh, get the gig. And <clears throat> by assign it, I mean you'll hire someone to do some work where you're not the freelance, but you're the company. And they'll say, we're going to pay you whatever it is, $8,000 for this item. And uh, next month we may have some more work for you, so on and so forth. That's lovely, but wouldn't it be nicer to have somebody say, you know what, we have work for you basically every month, some month a lot, some months not so much. Why don't we pay you a fee every month, and that way we can just call you when we like. Excuse me. That is gold, and you should do whatever you can to get to that kind of uh, arrangement, which is called the payment of a retainer, and, um, and you should uh, do a few things. Number one, you should set some limits uh, on, on how much you'll, you'll do in a month you know, for something. If, they, if you're hiring to be a writer, for instance, those of you in business writing have, have gone through this exercise. You want to be sure that you're not promising to work basically four 40-hour weeks in a month, unless that's how much you're paying paying you, in which case maybe you should look at full-time employment. Uh, you want to find out what the limits are uh, that you'll be expected to do. Uh, you want to talk about whether or not it's going to roll over month to month if you, if you don't do much work for them. Um, and on, on the writer's end, on the freelancer's end, on the consultant's end, you want to be sure that um, you understand that you'll uh, that, that it's okay to I look cross-eyed now this is terrible um, you want to be sure that that uh, you, you uh, are willing to cut back on how much you're going to ask maybe your standard fee for a, a document a certain type of document is four thousand dollars well if you know that that's the only gig you might ever get from that person then four thousand dollars is a fine price and they come back in six months you charge them another four thousand or whatever it is but if they're going to, uh, if they say, well, we'll give you this kind of thing every month, maybe you want to do it for $3,000 a month. Maybe you want to do it on a retainer of $2,500 a month. I would rather have uh, $2,500 or $3,000 a month guaranteed for the next six months than uh, say, well, we'll just do it a point at a time, and I do it this month at $4,000 the next month. Maybe they want me. Maybe they don't. Maybe something's come up. You know, I don't want to do it that way. There is value cash value in saving your time from having to uh, prospect for new work, negotiate new work, get that thing set up and just and just go. So if you can get somebody to agree to a retainer, uh, you've done a very smart thing for your work. Maybe I should have put that up there and made me look up the whole time. It'd be better. It's just like class, but without all the dancing. All right. Uh, number eight here in the money matters. Number eight is charge by the piece and not by the uh, not by the hour. That would have been great if I could have been more alliterative with that. Now I'm talking to myself. This is not good. Um, that is to say, a lot of writers are going to make more per, uh, per hour than they might reasonably be able to uh, bill. Uh, let's say somebody's going to pay, I don't know, they want a, they want a white paper on something and and that white paper may be worth to that company. Again, I'm just pulling a number out of the air. That white paper may be worth $2,500 to them. If you can write it in, say, five hours, uh, it's it's unlikely that you would be able to say, well, you know what, I'm going to bill you by the hour, and I'm going to charge you $500 an hour. They'll go, I've got lawyers that, that make less than that. I'm not going to pay you $500 an hour. But the bottom line is, what is the value of that work to the uh, the people in the uh, in the uh, in that organization, so you want to charge by the value, charge by the work itself, not by the hour. Uh, in addition, uh, this especially applies to writing. Uh, if you charge by the hour, it's very easy for people to feel like they're getting uh, metaphorically nickeled and dimed to death. It's better to charge somebody for the whole piece uh, and and uh, and offer to do. The revisions, the edits, at a reasonable, a reasonable number of re, uh, edits, as we've discussed in class, uh, reasonable edits and and uh, rewrites uh, for that flat price. Uh, because if you if you're gonna let's say whatever you're charging, let's say it's just for for arithmetic, let's say it's a hundred bucks an hour. Uh, so if you write a write a document or white paper and it takes twenty five hours, you charge twenty five hundred dollars, and then they want to do some revisions and say it takes. Another four hours. That's another four hundred bucks. Right now they've gone from twenty five hundred to over three thousand dollars, and some organizations are really going to balk at that kind of stuff. 
and they're going to start really getting picky about the changes. Now you've got a bad feeling, and that, that ruins the whole thing. Better to just charge 3000 or whatever, 2500 and, uh, and and try to get it right the first time. Uh, make the edits that they want. Again, within reason, if they ask for two or three total rewrites, then you've got a problem. You have to discuss that. But it's not going to happen very often. Uh, try to charge by the assignment. Base it on the value. Try not to charge by hour unless there's a defined range of work and a defined range of payment that cannot vary. All right? Um, so that is uh, part two. Let's move to part three, uh, numbers 9, 10, and 11, finding work. And number nine is this. Everyone is your friend, and you're the king of networking. Maybe you're the queen of networking. Uh, I'm perfectly happy with, with, with whatever you choose. <laughs> All I mean by that is everyone is your friend. Everyone can be a source of work. Everyone who you know, whether professionally or personally, may be in contact with an individual or enterprise or organization that can use your services. Make certain everybody knows, hey, I'm working for myself now. This is the kind of work I do. I've got great recommendations, great credentials. Please spread the word. People are happy to help their friends. They want to help their friends. Let them help their friends. Spread the word, make friends with everybody, go to events where you can meet people. You don't have to be a salesperson about this and hand out cards. You don't have to be pushy about it. Um, you, uh, but you do need to be, and not if there's anything wrong with being a salesperson, that's a lovely thing. I'm thinking of Melissa right now. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with, with letting people know that you're on the market for this kind of stuff. That's, that's good. Uh, so, so never miss a chance to meet people and be sure that you let them know what it is that you do. It's, uh, it's, uh, the, it's, there's no magic to networking. It's just a matter of volume. It's like entering a, a lottery. The more tickets you buy, the more likely you are to win. Number 10, learn to do conversion. That means uh, to take whatever project you've written and make it into some other saleable project. Now, those of you who have written op-eds or speeches know what I'm talking about. Uh, let me explain it for those of you who don't know about conversion, number 10 here. If I write, let's say, a speech for someone, uh, and they're involved in a larger campaign or effort to, to spread the word about a topic, it might make sense for me to offer to convert that speech into an op-ed. Or if they've written an op-ed, we might use it as the basis for a speech so on and so forth like that. Uh, it's good for you because it gives you additional work, and it's good for them because it gives them more bang for the buck. You may have charged, whatever, 3000 for the speech, and you can very easily convert that speech into an op-ed in a couple of hours and maybe give them a lot of benefit for six or $700. Again, I'm just doing easy arithmetic. I'm not saying these are real-world world, real world prices necessarily. Uh, so let's say maybe you can you can give them something for maybe 25% of the cost the original cost and they get a whole new slot, slot at the market. Uh, that's that's a great thing to do. So anytime you write something, any document you produce, look for the opportunity to make it into something else. Uh, they get more for their money and you get more money, and that's good. Finally, number eleven, the third point of part three, is to do donor maintenance. Uh, those of you who, who work in, uh, in uh, that philanthropy field know what I'm talking about. Uh, in commercial projects, it's basically the same thing. When you've got somebody who's a client, think of them as a donor. Think of them as somebody who needs some sort of support, who deserves your attention. Send them a note at, at the holidays, at Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever they celebrate. Uh, 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 if you see an article in a newspaper magazine that you think would be useful to them, Copy the copy the URL and just send it to them with a, with with a, a quick thought. Hey, I saw this. It applies to what you've been working on. Hope this hope this is useful. Best Mike. That's it. Don't say, Hey, by the way, I'm still here. Blah blah blah. The fact that you show you're thinking of them in professional capacities with their professional needs at heart is going to show that you're available. Uh, reach out to folks uh, in any way you 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 can in a casual way. So uh, connect with them on Facebook if that's appropriate for what you do on Facebook. You need to keep that appropriate, of course. Uh, uh, ping them on LinkedIn once in a while. If you have something, you can ask them if you need their expertise. Maybe uh, reach out to them. If uh, there's some work, you can. Uh, if there's a client, a new client, you can suggest for their enterprise. 
that's good too. These are the basics of doing business, and they matter more than anything, uh, more, more, more to, uh, more to uh, uh, freelancers and consultants than they do to anybody else, because a freelancer consultant is, in many cases, basically a one-man band. Companies have whole departments dedicated to the things that I've been talking about with you today. In, in, in a freelance setting, it's just you. That's all there is. So reach out to those uh, clients, those donors, uh, uh, frequently and, and uh, in a in casual and friendly way to keep yourself top of mind. So there are three sections, the foundation of the work, the uh, money considerations, and, and finding work. Uh, the rules are, number one, figure out if you're ready to do this. Number two, think about the practicalities of what your day-to-day -day life will be like financially, personally. One I didn't mention is, is family considerations. You may be ready to live uh, uh, for a while paycheck to paycheck. Can your family deal with that stress? That's a big issue. Uh, can you, uh, if you, let's say your, your uh, spouse spends half the day at home. Maybe they work at home, in which case see them for good advice. Or maybe they work at home. Uh, is it going to be a lot of uh, unanticipated tension for the two of you to be together all the time like that? Check it out. Think about the practicalities. Walk through the day point by point to see physically where you're going to be and what you're going to need to get things done. Don't extend yourself uh, past the point where you can't pay things back. That's number three. Number four, figure out where that point of no return is by calculating the nut. Write down dollar for dollar how much it costs you to pay your minimum core bills every month. The things which, if not paid, will get you into trouble with finance companies uh, uh, and, and everybody else. Number five, administrivia, as I call it, is a bigger deal than you think. The administration aspect of the work you do eats up more time than you'll expect. Uh, making calls to follow up on potential new clients. Uh, keeping up computer equipment. Uh, making a list and following of the things you need to do, doing your banking, uh, doing your taxes, sorting out these uh, receipts here at the end of every month. And I'm about three months behind on that, four months behind probably. Calculate the administrivia and account for it. Uh, number six, set up your finances formally. If you do nothing else, set up a separate account for your taxes and set aside the calculated percentage of each month, um, of, of uh, income each month, or of each check, rather, that, that you need to pay your taxes so you don't fall behind and end up in the old gray bar hotel. Uh, number seven uh, in part two, retainers are king. Uh, One-off project is great, but anybody who shows the potential, any organization shows the potential for multiple uh, assignments is a prime candidate for a retainer. Number eight, pricing. Charge by the piece or the value, not by the hour. It's uh, easier to avoid sticker shock that way and keeps everybody happier and keeps them your client longer. Number nine, this is uh, in part three, finding work. Network. Everyone's your friend. Even if they don't know anything about the kind of work you do, <coughs> they may need, know someone who needs it. Put yourself in as many places as possible. Number 10, learn to do conversion. This especially applies to the writing aspect. If you've written a, a memo, perhaps that's a good basis for a booklet that'll be used throughout the company. It's possible. And number 11, do donor maintenance. Networking is finding new clients. Donor maintenance, as I casually call it, is making certain the clients you have stay around. That means reaching out to them in a friendly way, uh, letting them know that, that you're there and that you're thinking about them in ways other than how can you pay me more money. All right, so that's uh, what I've got for you today. Uh, I, I don't uh, uh, have any uh, homework for you to follow up with this. I just wanted you to hear it. Uh, and if you've uh, made it this far in the lecture, uh, which I assume you have because you do what you're asked to do in my class, then there we are. I will uh, see you again uh, soon. Thanks. Bye.